Hi, welcome back. Today we'll be going over Romans chapter 7 through 16 to coincide with the Come Follow Me for August 14th through the 20th. And I'll just be reading the Institute Manual from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And my main purpose for doing this is because um, I wouldn't read it otherwise. <laughs> if I don't read it with with this uh, little podcast I'm doing, I'm just not going to read it. I have so many other things, but it's a, something I want to do. And I just won't do it unless I read it with you. So I'll, here I go. I'm going to read it. And you're welcome to join me and listen. But that's also why when you listen to these, I never ask like, oh, please share, please subscribe, please like the video and make comments. Is, is I really don't care. <laughs> most most of the feedback I get is negative on this because it's just so stinking boring, I think. But um, as I, so <laughs> I hope somebody likes it. But if not, um, I really don't care that much. I'm doing this because if I record it, then I'll do it. Otherwise, I'm just not going to read it. So we'll jump in. It says, a metaphor of two marriages freed from the law of Moses joined to Christ. Paul used a marriage metaphor to explain that Israel was once bound to the law of Moses as a wife is bound to her husband. But now that the law is fulfilled, Israel should be bound or married to Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, In Romans 7, verses 1 through 4, Paul compares Israel's allegiance to the law of Moses with that of a wife to her husband. As long as her husband lives, a wife is bound to him, must obey his laws, and if she can be with another, she is an adulteress. But when the husband dies, he can no longer direct her actions, and she is free to marry another. She can no longer be subject to him that is dead. So with Israel and the law, as long as the law, the law lived and was therefore in force, Israel was married to it and required to obey its provisions. But now the law is fulfilled. It no longer lives. It has become dead in Christ. And Israel is married to another, even to Christ, whose gospel law must now be obeyed. What the law could not do. Some devout Jews had accused Paul of speaking blasphemously against the law of Moses. In Romans chapter 7 and 8, Paul clarified his position by explaining that the law of Moses was good, but it had limitations. The law taught what sin was, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, and therefore the law was holy. But the law could not overcome the effects of the fall, which makes mankind carnal, sold under sin, And the law alone could not correct the problem of human weakness or provide means for people to be transformed by the Spirit. Let's read uh, Galatians 3.21. It says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid! For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. For that we need the grace made available through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Clarifications. I'm not going to read this. So read the Joseph Smith translation when you read your the text. We should be doing that anyway, so I'm not going to read his translations. Uh, the conflict between the flesh and the inward man. In Romans 7 through 8, Paul wrote about the conflict between the inward man and the flesh. It says to see Galatians 5.17, which says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Because of the fall, our mortal bodies sometimes experience feelings and desires, which, if followed, lead to acts contrary to the laws of God. Paul used first-person pronouns in this passage, I, my flesh, sin dwelleth in me, and so on. But his teachings describe the inner struggle common to all who strive to live the laws of God. Like other ancient writers, he sometimes wrote in first-person rhetorically to discuss conditions that applied to all people. Paul's statement, With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
does not mean that Paul yielded to temptations of the flesh, but it meant that even as he yielded to God, his flesh opposed him. The crucial point for Paul was that he knew the source of deliverance from the weakness of the flesh. Compare Isaiah 6, 6 6-8, which says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And Second Nephi four nineteen through 20 says, And when I desire to rejoice, my heart groaneth because of my sins. Nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. My God hath been my support. He hath led me through mine afflictions in the wilderness, and he hath preserved me upon the waters of the great deep. President Russell M. Nelson spoke of the trials related to our physical bodies. Not an age in life passes without temptation, trial, or torment experienced through your physical body. But as you prayerfully develop self-mastery, desires of the flesh may be subdued. And when that has been achieved, you may have the strength to submit to your Heavenly Father, as did Jesus, who said, Not my will, but thine be done. When deepening trials come your way, remember this glorious promise of the Savior. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In Romans 8, 1-13, Paul referred often to the Spirit and to the flesh. With the word Spirit, he was primarily referring to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus or to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Jesus Christ established after the law of Moses. With the word flesh, he was primarily referring to the law of Moses, which was weak through the flesh. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said of Romans 8, 1-13, Life and peace come not through the law of Moses, but through Christ and his saving grace. The Mosaic performances deal with carnal things, the things of the flesh, the things of death. There is not power in them to atone, to ransom, to save, to bring joy and peace here and eternal life hereafter. But Christ deals with spiritual things, the things of the Spirit, the things that bring life. Because of him, he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Romans 8.13 Mortifying the deeds of the body through the Spirit some, mem- some groups in Christianity and other religious traditions have believed that the only way to overcome desires of the flesh is to abstain completely from physical pleasures. However, many physical pleasures are not sinful but are good. Paul taught that the companionship of the Holy Ghost can make it possible for us to use our bodies according to God's purposes for his children. The Spirit can mortify or put to death or subdue the deeds of the body and impart spiritual life says to also see Galatians 5.16, which says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Elder Parley P. Pratt of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles similarly taught, The gift of the Holy Ghost purifies all the natural passions and affections and adapts them by the gift of wisdom to their lawful use. We are the children of God. This part's, I read this in one of my other videos. It's, okay, we'll read it. It says, The scriptures speak of us as children of God in more than one sense. First, every human being is literally a beloved spirit child of Heavenly Father. Let's see Malachi 2.10, which says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Acts seventeen twenty nine. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Hebrews twelve nine. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. 
Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Second, we are reborn as children of God through a covenantal relationship when we manifest faith in Jesus Christ, repent, are baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. So that's John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 3. 26 through 29, for ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Neither There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mosiah 5, 7. And now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. And then DNC 1130. But verily, verily, I say unto you that as many as receive me, to them will I give power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on my name. Amen. And Moses chapter 6, 65 through 68 says, And thus he was baptized, and the Spirit of God descended upon him, and thus he was born of the Spirit, and became quickened in the inner man. And he heard a voice out of heaven saying, Thou art baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is the record of the Father and the Son from henceforth and forever. And thou art after the order of him who is without beginning of days or end of years, from all eternity to all eternity. Behold, thou art one in me, a son of God. And thus may all become my sons. Amen. The context of Romans 8.16 makes clear that Paul was speaking of the second covenantal meaning when he stated, We are the children of God. The children of God that Paul spoke of were those who, by virtue of their covenant relationship with Christ, were led by the Spirit of God. The companionship of the Holy Ghost is God's assurance that we are his covenant children and that if we are faithful, we will one day be glorified together with Jesus Christ. The blessings Paul discussed in Romans 8, blessings such as being heirs of God, the Spirit's intercession on our behalf, and the full manifestations of God's enduring love are enjoyed by God's covenant children, but not necessarily by all of his spirit children. Well, wow, so they changed that entire section because like a year ago when I read this for part of my one of my videos, it was not this at all. It talked about this first meaning of being the son of God, which, and I, I criticized the manual for doing that because it was just wrong. It says um, in the verse, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And uh, in verse 17, and it says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And it's not all heirs are all children of Christ are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's not everybody. That's only those that um, become sons of Jesus Christ through the covenant relationship. So I'm glad they changed it. That's great. Interesting. The spirit of adoption. Caesar Augustus, who was the, rule, the ruler of Rome at the time of Christ's birth, was adopted by his predecessor, Julius Caesar. Adoption was common in the Roman world and would have been a familiar concept to Paul's readers. A person who legally adopted someone conferred on that person all the rights and privileges that a natural-born child would have. Therefore, when we receive the spirit of adoption through entering the gospel covenant, we become the children of God and joint heirs with Christ. We cry, Abba, Father. 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Savior addressed God in, in prayer using the Aramaic term Abba, which means Father or My Father. The Savior instructed His followers that they too were to address God as their Father in Heaven. Paul's statement, We cry Abba, Father, indicates that early Christians followed the Savior's way of addressing God. They may have felt that Father reflected the close personal relationship they enjoyed with God. Of all the titles that referred to God's greatness, Father is the one he has asked his children to use when calling upon him. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained what it means to be joint heirs with Christ. A joint heir is one who inherits equally with all others, heirs including the chief heir who is the son. Each joint heir has an eternal and an undivided portion of the whole of everything. If one knows all things, so do all others. If one has all power, so do all those who inherit jointly with him. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency taught that becoming heirs of God means that we become like God. In the theology of the restored church of Jesus Christ, the purpose of mortal life is to prepare us to realize our destiny as sons and daughters of God, to become like him. The Bible describes mortals as the children of God and as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It also declares that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together, and that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We take these Bible teachings literally. We believe that the purpose of mortal life is to acquire a physical body and through the atonement of Jesus Christ and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel to qualify for the glorified resurrected celestial state that is called exaltation or eternal life. If we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. When Paul declared that we must suffer with Christ, he did not mean that we would suffer what the Savior did as part of his atoning sacrifice, but rather that we would go through our own suffering with him. Elder Keith R. Edwards of the Seventy explained that approaching suffering in this way allows us to know the Savior better. We can learn spiritual lessons if we can approach suffering, sorrow, or grief with a focus on Christ. Anciently, Paul wrote that our suffering may give us an opportunity to know the Savior better. Paul wrote to the Romans, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if it so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, lest anyone go looking for hardship and suffering, that is not what is taught. Rather, it is the attitude with which we approach our hardships and trials that allows us to know the Savior better. As we are called upon to endure suffering, sometimes inflicted upon us intentionally or negligently, we are put in a unique position. If we choose, we may be allowed to have new awareness of the suffering of the Son of God. We can have a greater appreciation for that which he did, and we can feel his spirit succoring us, and we can know the Savior in a very real sense. So I want to share, so it says that we'll be glorified together. And in Isaiah chapter uh, 42, verse 8, it says something that makes that statement a little bit confusing because it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And so the Lord will not give his glory to another, but it says right here in Romans, where were we? Romans chapter 8, that we will be glorified together. So how do we receive that glory? And um, I think there's, it's, it's maybe not quite as straightforward as it seems, but uh, the Savior has earned glory through the atoning sacrifice. And th there's a portion of that glory that only he can receive. There's not going to be another one like Christ in heaven. Um, there's not going to be another one like the Father in heaven, uh, in, in that glory. But glory is an eternal progression. And so 
at some point in an infinite existence, we can attain to the same glory that our Father in Heaven is at now through creation, because um, God's glory is in His creation. And so, uh, as we create and and achieve similar things that our Father in Heaven has achieved, as each son grows to be like their father, then we can achieve to the point where he is maybe now, but by then he'll far exceed us in glory still because he'll be that much further along in the, the creation process. So that's kind of how I see it anyway, because somehow you have to square these two square, these two scriptures where it says that he will not give his glory to another. I think, I think Christ has his own, um, there's a certain honor and privilege and glory that comes with his atoning sacrifice. And so that's how I see that. But, but we also receive glory and we are one with Christ and one with the father in glory and in holiness and godliness, um, by degrees. And we know that there's certain degrees of glory. So maybe that makes a little bit more sense. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. To intercede is to plead or act on behalf of another person. In Romans 8, 26-27, Paul taught that at times we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Speaking of the Spirit's intercession with us, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained that the Holy Ghost gives direction to the faithful, causing them to know and speak the mind and will of the Lord. Perfect prayers are always inspired by the Spirit, and they are always answered because the Spirit knows beforehand what ye should pray for. All things work together for good to them that love God. Elder James B. Martino of the 70s spoke about the meaning of Paul's words found in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for them, for good to them that love God. Quote, the Apostle Paul taught an interesting lesson only a few years before the saints in Rome were to face some of the most violent persecution of any Christian era. Paul reminded the saints that all things work together for good to them that love God. Our Heavenly Father, who loves us completely and perfectly, permits us to have experiences that will allow us to develop the traits and attributes we need to become more and more Christ-like. Our trials come in many forms, but each will allow us to become more like the Savior as we learn to recognize the good that comes from each experience. As we understand this doctrine, we gain greater assurance of our Father's love. We may never know in this way, in this life, why we face what we do, but we can feel confident that we can grow from the experience. Conform to the image of his Son. Prophet Joseph Smith spoke of what it means to be conformed to the image of God's Son. After God had created the heavens and the earth, he said, Let us make man in our own image. In whose image? In the image of the gods created they them, male and female, innocent, harmless, and spotless, bearing the same character and the same image as the gods. And when man fell, he did not lose his image, but his character still retained the image of his Maker. Christ, who is the image of man, is also the express image of his Father's person. Through the atonement of Christ and the resurrection, in obedience to the gospel, we shall again be conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. Then we shall have attained to the image, glory, and character of God. The firstborn among many brethren. Paul referred to Christ, to Jesus Christ as the firstborn among many brethren. Man, I just did a video on my other channel um, just a couple days ago, and we went over all this stuff. It's interesting. Should have done this first. I might have made a better video. Let's see. Referring to the Savior of our elder brother is indeed accurate in a sense, but it may inadvertently minimize the reverence we should give him as our Savior, as the Creator, and as the God, as the God, God the Son. President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, quote, Some Latter-day Saints have tended to focus on Christ's sonship as opposed to his godhood. As members of earthly families, we can relate to him as a child, as a son, and as a brother because we know how he f that feels. We can personalize that relationship because we ourselves are children, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. 
For some, it may be more difficult to relate to him as a god, and so, in an attempt to draw closer to Christ and to cultivate warm and personal feelings toward him, some tend to humanize him, sometimes at the expense of acknowledging his divinity. So let us be very clear on this point. It is true that Jesus was our elder brother in the premortal life, but we believe that in this life it is crucial that we become born again and his sons and daughters in the gospel covenant. And it's important here, this is something where it says we acknowledge his divinity. Christ is a divine being. And um, in the living Christ, that's something that I wish was there to say that Christ is God. He is divine and, and we worship him. Because all those things are true and you'll find them here in institute manuals and on the church website and stuff. But... It's not clear, and in the world of is of Christendom, many people don't see that we worship Jesus Christ through, and on the website it gives a bunch of different ways, but um, Jesus Christ is divine, As, and he's the Son of God. Romans 8, 29 through 30, predestination. In Romans 8, 29 through 30, the, the Greek term translated as predestinate means to appoint beforehand and refers to the foreordination some people receive based on God's foreknowledge to follow Jesus Christ and become like him. Foreordination does not guarantee that individuals will receive certain callings or responsibilities. Such opportunities come in this life as a result of the righteous exercise of agency, just as foreordination came as a result of righteousness in the premortal existence. If God be for us, who can be against us? Paul taught that the atonement of Christ shows that God is for us and is committed to us in our eternal well-being. Because God gave even his only begotten Son for us, we can be assured that God will continue to work for our salvation and prepare us to be heirs of all he wants to give us. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland similarly exhorted members of the church, quote, Considering the incomprehensible cost of the crucifixion of atonement, I promise you... He is not going to turn his back on us now, brothers and sisters. Whatever your distress, please don't give up. More than conquerors. In Romans 8.37, the Greek phrase translated as more than conquerors means abundantly victorious and winning an overwhelming victory. This term mirrors Paul's much more passages in Romans 5.9-20, which emphasize that the grace of God made available through the atonement of Jesus Christ is more powerful than the effects of the fall. Points to ponder. When have you experienced God's grace in the form of daily strength and assistance to remain faithful? When have you experienced grace to help you overcome sin? What truths in Romans 6, 1 through 11 could you ponder the next time you partake of the sacrament to renew your baptismal covenant? Oh, this is talking about um, the symbolism of being baptized and dying in Jesus Christ and being freed and resurrected with him. Okay, so we'll go on to chapters 9 through 16. Introduction and Timeline for Romans 9 through 16. Having expounded many of the essential saving doctrines of the gospel in chapters 1 through 8, Paul then focused on the application of the gospel in church and civic life. In Romans 9 through 11, Paul dealt with Israel's election, rejection of the gospel, and eventual salvation. Though God had made his covenant anciently with Abraham and his posterity, God's chosen people were determined not primarily by lineage, but by faithfulness to the covenant. Church members could prepare the way for those outside the church to accept the gospel by being faithful, humble, and merciful. 
In Romans 12 through 15, Paul counseled church members to live the gospel in order to foster peace and church unity. This requires willingness to sacrifice, to trust the Lord, and to subordinate self-interest to the interests of others. Paul closed his epistle with an account of his future plans, a request for the prayers and assistance of the saints in Rome, and a plea for those same saints to continue obeying the gospel. The Purposes of God for Israel and the Gentiles In Romans 9-11, through Paul used the terms Israel and Israelites instead of Jews. Paul used Israel to mean God's covenant people, the house of Israel, in contrast to the Jews of his day, who had largely rejected the Savior. In Old Testament times, God had chosen the house of Israel to be his covenant people, and he promised that the Savior would come to them. But when Jesus Christ came to earth, most Jews dismissed him, and some put him to death, and his followers faced continuing opposition from Jewish leaders who were members of the house of Israel. One of Paul's purposes in Romans 9:11 through 11 was to address the Jews' rejection of the Savior and the implications of this rejection. Why did the gospel of Jesus Christ not result in more conversions among the very people who had been given the promise of the Messiah? Paul maintained that Israel's refusal of the gospel did not mean that the word of God hath taken none effect. Just because the Jews in general had rejected Jesus Christ, this did not make the gospel message fruitless or ineffectual. Paul reasoned that not all people who were Israelites by lineage could be considered to be part of covenant Israel. The word of God was taking root among the Gentiles. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, Some of the house of Israel, after such a favored birth, after being numbered with the chosen seed, turn from the course of righteousness and become children of the flesh. That is, they walk after the manner of the world, rejecting the spiritual blessings held in store for Israel. Paul also observed that Israel's rejection of the gospel and the taking of the gospel to the Gentiles fulfilled prophecy verifying God's word rather than discrediting it. See Ephesians 3, 3 through 6 says, How that by revelation he has made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, he may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Lineage does not determine spiritual status. Paul taught that not all people born into the house of Israel actually received the promises of the Lord's covenant with Israel. Paul noted that the Lord's covenant with Abraham was perpetuated only through the lineage of Isaac and not through that of Ishmael, Abraham's other son. Paul used this illustration to prepare his readers to be taught that faithful Gentiles may be counted as part of Israel and receive the blessings of the gospel covenant. Galatians 3, 27-29 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye are, and if ye be Christ's, then ye, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul's teachings also show that although someone may be born into a favored lineage or a family of great faith, he or she cannot receive the blessings of gospel covenants without being obedient to God's commandments. Similarly. A Latter-day Saint can be saved only through individual faith and obedience. President Russell M. Nelson taught the development of faith in the Lord is an individual matter. Each of us is born individually. Likewise, each of us is born again individually. Salvation is an individual matter. Election From the Bible Dictionary, we learn that election is the theological term primarily denoting God's choice of the house of Israel to be the covenant people with privileges and responsibility, responsibilities that they might become a means of blessing to the whole world. The elect are chosen even before the foundation of the world, yet no one is unconditionally elected to eternal life, 
Each must, for himself, hearken to the gospel and receive its ordinances and covenants from the hands of the servants of the Lord in order to obtain salvation. If one is elected, but does not serve, his election could be said to have been in vain, as Paul expressed in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, which says, We then, as workers, together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. An election of grace spoken of in DNC 84 and Romans 11 has reference to one's situation in mortality, that is, being born at a time, at a place, and in circumstances where one will come in favorable contact with the gospel. This election took place in the premortal existence. Those who are faithful and diligent in the gospel in mortality receive an even more desirable election in this life and become the elect of God. These receive the promise of a fullness of God's glory in eternity. Latter-day prophets have taught that those born into the house of Israel were foreordained to the, that lineage in premortality. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, The greatest and most important talent or capacity that any of the spirit children of the Father could gain is the talent of spirituality. Most of those who gained this talent were chosen before they were born to come to earth as members of the house of Israel. They were foreordained to receive the blessings that the Lord promised to Abraham and to his seed in all their generations. This foreordination is an election. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Paul's mention of the children not yet born refers specifically to the children of Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob. Paul then quoted language from Malachi 1, verses 2 through 3, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It seems strange that God should choose one brother to hate and one to love. But while the Greek word used here does mean hate in the same sense that we use it, the Hebrew root translated as hate carried many shades of meaning, including rejection, strong displeasure, or very commonly loving less than. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave this explanation of Paul's words found here. God chose Jacob over Esau while the two were yet in Rebekah's womb, and before either, as far as the works of this life are concerned, had earned any preferential status. Why? It is a pure matter of pre-existence. Jacob was coming into the world with greater spiritual capacity than Esau. He was foreordained to a special work. He was elected to serve in a chosen capacity. Then through the lineage of Jacob, God sent those valiant spirits, those noble and great ones, who was his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge he knew would be inclined to serve him. Through Esau came those spirits of lesser valiance and devotion. Hence, in the very nature of things, many of Jacob's seed were righteous in this life, and many of Esau's were wicked, causing Malachi to say in the Lord's name some 1,500 years later that God loved the house of Jacob and hated the house of Esau. Is there unrighteousness with God? As Paul wrote about the foreordination of the house of Israel, he realized that some church members might feel that the doctrine of election was unfair. Gentile saints might have wondered why God restricted his covenant anciently to Abraham and his descendants, while Jewish Christians might have wondered why God would accept Gentiles into the church and consider them part of the house of Israel. Paul's counsel to his readers was not to dispute against God. Does God cause people to be hard-hearted? In Romans 9.17, Paul quoted Exodus 9.16, which states that God raised up Pharaoh in order to show his power. Paul also said, Whom God will he hardeneth. These passages do not mean that God caused Pharaoh or other people to be wicked. Such an interpretation would contradict truths taught elsewhere in the scriptures about how God desires the salvation of all people, and how God's gift of agency makes us free to choose to follow him or reject him. A key to understanding Paul's statement is to recognize that he was Reasoning from the book of Exodus, which tells of the Pharaoh who opposed God's deliverance of Egypt, of Israel from Egypt. The Exodus account, which would have been familiar to Paul's readers, speaks of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. The Joseph Smith translation clarifies that the Lord did not harden Pharaoh's heart, but that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. 
Paul's point was that even though Pharaoh fought against God, this did not frustrate the Lord's work of delivering Israel. Ultimately, Israel's deliverance, in spite of Pharaoh's stubbornness, served to reveal the Lord's power. Similarly, God did not cause Israel to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he permitted it. Israel's rebellion was something God endured with much long-suffering so that he could make known the riches of his glory to those who accept the gospel, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As part of Pharaoh hardening his heart, too, it's because the, the work of God through Moses was so obvious and evident that in order for Pharaoh to reject Moses and 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 God, he had to harden his heart further. And um, Isaiah says that people will do that more in these last days as well. Paul quoted from the Old Testament. In Romans 9, 25 through 26, Paul quoted from Hosea 1, 10 and 2, 23. Uh, he referred to Hosea as O.C. And in Romans 9, 29, he quoted from Isaiah 1, 9 and 29, 16, by referring to these Old Testament prophets, Paul taught that God's desire is to save all his children and that many Gentiles who are not his people by birth will become his people by being grafted into the gospel covenant. Going about to establish their own righteousness. Paul wrote that Israel sought righteousness by the works of the law, that is, by the rituals and observances of the law of Moses, rather than by faith in Jesus Christ. President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that Latter-day Saints sometimes commit a similar error by placing too much emphasis on works. No matter how hard we work, no matter how much we obey, no matter how many good things we do in this life, it would not be enough were it not for Jesus Christ and his loving grace. On our own, we cannot earn the kingdom of God, no matter what we do. Unfortunately, there are some within the church who have become so preoccupied with performing good works that they forget that those works, as good as they may be, are hollow unless they are accompanied by a complete dependence on Christ. Christ is the end of the law. Although the saints in Rome were often rejected by the Jews, we learn that Paul continued to love and respect the Jews and had concern for their salvation. He said that many Jews went about to establish their own righteousness, which meant that they were zealously striving to establish their own righteousness according to Jewish standards. They did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ. They rejected the gospel that could have ultimately led them to true righteousness. The word end in Romans 10.4 can mean conclusion or fulfillment, or it can mean an ultimate purpose or anticipated object. The performances of the law of Moses anticipated the Savior and his atonement, which represent the end of the law. Let's read Galatians 3, 24-26. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And let's read Alma 25, 15 through 16. Yea, and they did keep the law of Moses, for it was expedient that they should keep the law of Moses as yet, for it is not all fulfilled, but notwithstanding the law of Moses, they did look forward to the coming of Christ, considering that the law of Moses was a type of his coming and believing that they must keep those outward performances until the time that he should be revealed unto them. Now they did not suppose that salvation came by the law of Moses, but that the law of Moses did serve to strengthen their faith in Christ. And thus they did retain a hope through faith unto eternal salvation, relying upon the spirit of prophecy which spake of those things to come. Is confessing belief in Christ all one must do to be saved? Some Christians have used Paul's words in Romans 10, 9 to claim that all a person must do to be saved is verbally confess a belief in Jesus Christ. However, in other passages, Paul taught that repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and striving to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ are also essential. 
In Romans 10, 4-13, Paul's purpose was not to give a comprehensive description of the process of salvation. Instead, Paul was supporting the point that he stated in verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Paul quoted Deuteronomy 30, 12-14 to make the point that one need not ascend into heaven or descend into the deep to find Christ. Uh, Deuteronomy says, It is not in heaven that thou should say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Sometimes I feel like that's what we do, go into all these different podcasts and come follow me programs and stuff. Like everyone's looking all over. It's like it's right here. Just read your scriptures. Instead, all people, whether Jew or Greek, can find the Savior within their own hearts as they confess that he is the Savior and have faith in him. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency affirmed the requirements of salvation. Relying upon the totality of Bible teachings and upon class clarifications received through modern revelation, we testify that being cleansed from sin through Christ's atonement is conditioned upon the individual sinner's faith which must be manifested by obedience to the Lord's command to repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Jesus taught, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Believers who have had this required rebirth at the hands of those having authority have already been saved from sin conditionally, but they will not be saved finally until they have completed their mortal probation with the required continuing repentance, faithfulness, service, and enduring to the end. Preach the gospel of peace and bring good, bring glad tidings. Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught how Paul's words found in Romans 10, 14-15 emphasize the importance of sharing the gospel. Quote, Many wonderful church members are in camouflage to their neighbors and co-workers. They do not let people know who they are and what they believe. We need much more member involvement in sharing the message of the restoration. Romans 10, verse 14, puts this into perspective. How then shall they call on him, speaking of the Savior, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15 contains the wonderful message referenced in Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. It has been observed that the members are going to have to move their feet and let their voices be heard if they are to achieve this blessing. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. Paul taught that hearing the word of God is essential to developing faith in Jesus Christ. This teaching helps us understand that attendance at Sabbath day and other church meetings plays a vital role in the development of faith. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, The Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The first step to finding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is to let his word, spoken by the mouth of his servants, the prophets, touch your heart. But it is not enough merely to let those words wash over you, as if they alone could transform you. We must do our part, as or as the Savior himself said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, hearing requires an active effort. It means taking seriously what is taught, considering it carefully, studying it out in our minds. As the prophet Enos learned, it means letting others' testimonies of the gospel sink deep into our hearts. A Remnant of Israel even though many Jews did not accept Jesus as their Savior, Paul pointed out that God had not cast away his chosen people. As evidence of this, Paul pointed out that he himself was of the house of Israel. Paul went on to explain that in the time of ancient Israel, some people accepted God, while others did not. He quoted an Old Testament account describing Elijah's despair over the wickedness of Israel's people, many of whom had turned to worshipping false gods such as Baal. Elijah believed that he was the only righteous Israelite remaining. However, God told him, 
I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, As in the day of Elijah, so in the day of Paul, a few of Israel, a few of those foreordained and elected to receive the blessings of God in this life, a remnant of a once great nation, had remained faithful and true. The faithful remnants of Israel in Paul's day were those Jews who, like him, had accepted Jesus Christ as the long-promised Messiah. God's plan for the eventual salvation of Israel. Paul maintained that Israel had not fallen permanently, and he taught that Israel would experience a future fullness of salvation. In contrast to the smaller remnant of Jewish converts in Paul's day, many Book of Mormon prophecies also speak of the Lord's plan for Israel's eventual salvation. For example, Nephi declared, Those who are of the house of Israel shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that the Lord is their Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. Jesus taught the Nephites that the restoration of the church in the latter days, including the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, was part of the Lord's plan to gather and redeem Israel. It was to be a sign to the world that the fulfillment of his promises had commenced. I magnify mine office. In his special role as the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul directed the next part of his discourse to Gentile converts as he felt a great responsibility to magnify his office. President Thomas S. Monson taught, What does it mean to magnify a calling? It means to build it up in dignity and importance to make it honorable and commendable in the eyes of all men, to enlarge and strengthen it, to let the light of heaven shine through it to the view of other men. Or how does one magnify a calling? Simply by performing the service that pertains to it. An elder magnifies the, the ordained calling of an elder by learning what his duties as an elder are, and then by doing them. As with an elder, so with a deacon, a teacher, a priest, a bishop, and each who holds office in the priesthood. Analogy of the Olive Tree In Romans 11, 16-24, Paul taught about branches that had been grafted into an olive tree, referring to Gentiles who were adopted into the house of Israel. The natural olive tree is Israel, while the wild branches are the Gentiles. The Gentiles, or the wild branches, were grafted into the house of Israel, the tame tree, and became part of Israel. This analogy from agriculture described a process that was contrary to nature, for in the natural world, grafted branches control the destiny of the tree. A branch from a tame tree that is grafted into a wild tree makes the wild tree more tame. Paul described a process of wild branches being grafted into a tame tree, with the tree remaining tame. Paul used the analogy in this way, not to, out of ignorance, but to make a point. The conversion of the Gentiles did not change the destiny of the house of Israel, for the house of Israel is of great importance in the kingdom of God. Even though the gospel was being taken to the Gentiles during Paul's ministry, Israel was still the chosen family and the guardian of the Abrahamic covenant. Gentile Christians were to be humble and merciful to the Jews. Paul warned Gentile members of the church to not be high-minded. He admonished them to be humble and faithful and not to think they were better than Jews who had not embraced the gospel. Paul explained that by showing mercy and kindness to the Jewish people, Gentile Christians could prepare the way for Jews to eventually embrace the gospel and receive the Lord's mercy. If the Gentile members were prideful, they would suffer the same fate as the unrepentant Jews and be cut off from God's kingdom. This warning to not be high-minded or prideful should be heeded by all people who love the Lord and desire to return to God's presence. History shows that latter Gentile Christians largely failed to follow Paul's counsel and become hostile toward Jews. In later centuries, after Christians became a majority with political power, the rise of hateful anti-Jewish rhetoric among them led to violence against Jews. The Book of Mormon prophet wrote, O ye Gentiles, have you remembered the Jews, mine ancient covenant people? Nay, but ye have cursed them, and have hated them, and have not sought to recover them. But behold, I the Lord have not forgotten my people. 
and I will show unto them that fight against my word and against my people, who are the house of Israel, that I am God, and that I covenanted with Abraham that I would remember his seed forever. The fullness of the Gentiles. Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed the meaning of the fullness of the Gentiles. Quote, there was a period or time appointed for the Jews to hear the word, and then a period of time for the Gentiles to take precedence. The times of the Gentiles is the period during which the gospel goes to them on a preferential basis, and this will continue until they have had a full opportunity to accept the truth, or in other words, until the fullness of the Gentiles. Then the message will go again to the Jews, meaning to the Jews as a nation and as a people. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, As our body is the instrument of our spirit, it is vital that we care for it as best we can. We should consecrate it, its powers to serve and for further the work of Christ. Said Paul, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. When Paul spoke of giving our bodies as a living sacrifice, he drew a parallel to the Old Testament practice of sacrificing animals. President Russell M. Nelson taught, We are still commanded to sacrifice, but not by shedding blood of animals. Our highest sense of sacrifice is achieved as we make ourselves more sacred or holy. This we do by our obedience to the commandments of God. Thus the laws of obedience and sacrifice are indelibly intertwined. As we comply with these and other commandments, something wonderful happens to us. We become disciplined. We become disciples. We become more sacred and holy like our Lord. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Paul counseled church members not to be haughty or think too highly of themselves, but to associate with people of all social ranks. Sister Anne M. Dibb, who served as a member of the Young Women General Presidency and who is the daughter of President Thomas S. Monson, spoke of how her father exemplifies this ideal. My father's friends come from all walks of life. I'd like to tell you about one of my father's friends who would have been considered my, by others to be one of the least of these, my brethren. His name was Ed Erickson. He was almost 20 years older than my father. Ed was born prematurely and experienced some of the complications that accompanied premature births almost a century year ago. Ed couldn't see very well, and he never had the opportunity to study and learn at a university. My father was a loyal friend and actively sought to find ways for Ed to feel valued. Dad frequently hired Ed to help him clean his pigeon coops and do manual chores in our large yard. He was a big man. He looked different, and he didn't talk very much. Ed just did his work, ate dinner with us, and then Dad would take him home. This happened several times each year. In later years, when my father would get tickets to take his grandchildren to the circus or to the rodeo, Ed always came to sharing our popcorn and drinks. Ed passed away three years ago at the age of 96. If you had attended Ed's funeral, you would have thought it was the funeral of one of the greatest individuals who had ever lived, and actually, it was. It was the funeral of my father's lifelong friend, Ed Erickson. We are everyone members of, an, of another. says to see the commentary for 1 Corinthians, so we'll get to that later. Paul's counsel to church members, much of the Savior did in the sermon on, much as the Savior did in the Sermon on the Mount, Paul provided counsel to church members and taught them many principles about living a Christian life. Romans 12 contains verse after verse of such teachings. Love without dissimulation is love without hypocrisy. It is love unfeigned. Paul's counsel to mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate is reminiscent of the Savior's exhortation in Matthew 5 to be kind even to the publicans, those who are despised. Paul's words in Romans 12 have counterparts in Matthew 5.44, Mosiah 18.9, and D&C 42.45. So let's see, 
D and C 42, 45 says, Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die, more especially for those that have not hope of a glorious resurrection. Messiah 18.9 Yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witness of God at all times and in all things, and in all places that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God, and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that ye may have eternal life. And Matthew 5.44 says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The Joseph Smith translation for Romans 13 indicates that Paul's statements and these verses apply to following not only civic authorities, but also church authorities. For example, uh, in the translation that Joseph Smith added the words, in the church. There is no power in the church, but of God. In Joseph Smith's translation, Romans 13.4, sword was changed to rod. And uh, in verse 6, it says, tribute or taxes was changed to your consecrations. These verses also contain some of the clearest New Testament descriptions of a disciple's civic responsibility. There were good reasons for Paul to counsel Christians to be subject to civil authorities. Roman rulers placed a high priority on maintaining peace and quelling social unrest, and revolts were put down swiftly and violently. Earlier in Paul's ministry, unrest in the Jewish community in Rome had led to the expulsion of all Jews from the city for a time. Paul gave specific instructions about civic duties to help the church avoid harm in potentially volatile, circumstance, volatile circumstances. Paul's counsel to be subject unto the higher powers reflects the principle of the 12th article of faith. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. By describing civil authorities as being ordained of God and God's ministers, Paul acknowledged that all who hold positions of power are accountable to God, and they hold power only to the extent that God allows. The Armor of Light Paul's imagery in Romans 13.12 is similar to that found in Ephesians 6, where he urged readers to put on the whole armor of God. In the Romans passage, Paul admonished readers to cast off the works of evil and to arm themselves with the armor of light perhaps referring to Jesus Christ, who is the light and life of the world. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, My brothers and sisters, in this, the last great conflict between light and darkness, I am grateful for the opportunity to endure hardness as a disciple of Jesus Christ. With Paul, I declare the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I bear my special witness that Jesus Christ is the light and the life of the world, yea, the light that is endless, that can never be darkened. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Paul's counsel to make not provision for the flesh reflects the truth that controlling our thoughts is crucial to withstanding temptations. The Greek word translated as provision means forethought. When people succumb to temptation, it is often because they have allowed themselves to dwell on the temptation and think about committing the sin. President Boyd K. Packer suggested one way we can control our thoughts, quote, when temptation comes, you can invent a delete key in your mind, perhaps the words from your favorite hymn, your mind is in charge, your body is the instrument of your mind. When some unworthy thought pushes into your mind, replace it with your delete key. Worthy music is powerful and can help you control your thoughts. Close quote. Dealing with doubtful disputations. Paul pointed out that some church members choose to eat all things, while others choose to eat only herbs, or in other words, vegetables. Those who ate only vegetables were like Jewish converts, while those who ate other foods were probably Gentile converts. In addition, 
Some church members chose to follow Jewish customs, practices, and holidays. These differences in personal practices led to divisions among saints in Rome and other locations. In response to this problem, Paul taught that many personal choices concerning diet and other practices were not addressed by any specific commandment. Therefore, these were matters to be decided between the individual and the Lord. Paul taught that we should not impose our private interpretations on fellow church members or pass judgment on those who live differently. On the other hand, church members should consider the effect of their personal practices on others and be willing to forgo some actions if they might cause others to stumble spiritually. Promoting peace and edification in the church is a higher priority than maintaining personal preferences. Some actions and priorities simply matter more than others. Bear the infirmities of the weak. Paul taught that we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. President Gordon B. Hinckley related an example of strong members of the church bearing the infirmity of one who felt weak. Quote, Remember, we are not alone. We belong to a great body of friends, thousands upon thousands, who are striving to follow the teachings of the Lord. I remember interviewing a discouraged missionary. He was having trouble with a language which was not his own. He had lost the spirit of his work and wanted to go home. He was one of 180 missionaries in that mission. I told him that if he were to go home, he would break faith with his 179 companions. Every one of them was his friend. Every one of them would pray for him, fast for him, and do almost anything else to help him. They would work with him. They would teach him. They would get on their knees with him. They would help him to learn the language and be successful because they loved him. I am happy to report that he accepted my assurance that all of the other missionaries were his friends. They rallied around him, not to embarrass him, but to strengthen him. The terrible feeling of loneliness left him. He came to realize that he was part of a winning team. He became successful, a leader, and he has been a leader ever since. That's what each of us must do for one another. Paul wrote to the Romans, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and then he added these significant words, and not to please ourselves. The scriptures are a source of learning, comfort, and hope. Paul noted that the scriptures were written for our learning and to provide comfort and hope. To illustrate this truth, Paul then quoted several Old Testament scriptures to reassure the saints that missionary work to the Gentiles was in accordance with God's plan, and he encouraged all church members to accept one another. Did Paul ever journey to Spain? Paul intended ultimately to travel to Spain, though it is not known for certain whether Paul ever made it to Spain. There is some evidence suggesting that he did fulfill this desire. Writing about AD 96, Clement of Rome said that Paul had reached the boundaries or limits of the West, a phrase far more appropriate for Spain than for Rome. The early Muratorian fragment also says that Paul visited Spain, though its source of information is debated. Phoebe. At the close of his epistle, Paul highly condemned a church member named Phoebe, who was evidently the messenger who carried Paul's epistle to the saints in Rome. From Paul's description of Phoebe, we learned that she was a servant of the church, which is at Centria, and that she had been a succorer or benefactor of many members of the church, including Paul. Phoebe is an example of the important and trusted role women have in the church. Oh, did I say that right? I think I did. Paul's written approval of Phoebe is an example of the early Christian practice of carrying letters of recommendation when traveling to another Christian congregation. This custom is similar to the current church practices of transferring membership records and carrying temple recommends. Paul uses Paul's use of the scribes in writing his epistles. At the end of the epistle of Romans, the scribe who had written the epistle under Paul's direction inserted his own greeting to the saints in Rome. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Paul may have used scribes to compose many or all of his epistles. Ancient scribes had varying degrees of influence in what they wrote. Some would write a manuscript word for word as directed 
dictated by the sender. Others would revise and edit a draft written by the sender, and others would compose much of a text themselves, working from notes or instructions provided by the sender. Whichever approach was used, the sender would make sure the final text represented his or her intentions. Some New Testament scholars have debated whether some of the epistles bearing Paul's name were actually written by Paul. Much of this debate deals with subtle differences in style and wording among the epistles. However, many of these differences can be explained by Paul using different scribes on different occasions with varying degrees of personal input. Points to ponder. How does the doctrine of election apply to you? What does it imply about the importance of your personal faithfulness? Think of people you care about who are not members of the church and ponder Paul's counsel to Gentile Christians regarding those in his day who had not yet accepted the gospel. How could you apply Paul's teachings to bless the lives of those who have not yet accepted the gospel? Consider the principles that Paul taught to guide church members in matters of personal conscience. How can you apply those principles in your own choices regarding what clothes you wear and what you eat and drink, how you observe the Sabbath, how you use entertainment and technology, and so forth? I hope you enjoyed the reading. I'll see you next week.